Hi everyone, and welcome back to Horse Tales. I'm your host, Ashley Festchuk. Sable Island is located just off the tip of western Nova Scotia. Sable Island translated literally means Island of Sand. The unique landscape, history of shipwrecks, wildlife, especially horses, has attracted considerable international following. Today, I'm lucky enough to speak to naturalist Zoe Lucas about the island and the horses who make it their home. Let's saddle up and get started. Is where are you right now as we are speaking? I'm at the Sable Island Station on Sable Island. The station is the center of operations for the island and is now the uh, base of operations for parts of Canada. Right. So I'm inside because it's raining <laughs> and uh, I'm just doing uh, inside doing desk work and looking out the window, um, I can see uh, dunes in the distance with a few horses wandering by. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's so cool. Zoe, can you tell me a little bit about your job there and how long you've been working on the island? I first came to Sable Island in 1971, so that's 50 years ago. Um, early on during the first year, I just was coming to the island for a couple of months uh, during the summer and to, um, as a volunteer on uh, uh, dune restoration projects and uh, some research projects. And in the 80s, I started spending most of the year here. So uh, that's, um, so I come, generally, I was spending most of the year here until it became a national park in 2013. And then um, instead of, you know, 10 to 11 months a year, now it's more like uh, eight to nine months a year on the island. Okay. And what type of research, like, what, what type of research do you do there now? So I'm primarily a naturalist, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of the work that I've done, you know, from the beginning has been um, <clears throat> to, uh, a wide range of things. As I said, I was managing dune restoration projects, uh, working on the horses, um, uh, doing research projects such as looking at shark predation on seals. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping track of the comings and goings of birds, uh, beach monitoring programs, which involve looking for beached plastics, and also uh, for oiled or entangled seabirds. So a, a wide range of things, and being, a, being here for more than just short bursts of research activity enabled me to um, fill more of the naturalist role, which is recording and documenting things that happen that might be uh, missed if someone I wasn't traveling the beach or, or working on the dunes on a regular basis. Right. And so how long are you are you able to stay there on this trip? Well, I'm going to stay here um, until uh, early August, probably. Right. And then go back to uh, mainland for six weeks and then come back here in the fall. Okay. So do, would you, do you do roughly two trips a year or is it, it depends? No, it varies. It, it just it can, depends entirely on um, what I have to do on the mainland, uh, what I have to do here, who I might be collaborating with, what projects I'm working on. So I would say my shortest trip would probably be maybe a month. Right. Um, but generally, I prefer to stay here for at least three to four months at a stretch. Right. And is there is it fair to say that there's a window of opportunity in terms of traveling there that is, you know, weather dependent? Um, I wouldn't, excuse me, I wouldn't say uh, there's a window of opportunity. It is, just, it is very weather dependent. Mm -hmm. It's not only dependent upon the weather itself, but it's also dependent upon conditions on the island. So, for instance, if you're trying to travel here by a fixed-wing aircraft, um, they have to find a, a place to land the aircraft on the beach. And so you can have a beautiful, fine day for flying, but if the beach is flooded because of ocean overwash, you can't come. Right. Helicopters make it easier because you don't have to rely on the beach. So the, the, the three ways that people get to Sable Island are by fixed-wing aircraft, by helicopter, and by boat. Right. 
And so um, is there someone that stays there year round or is it is it empty part of the year? No, there's um, there's since 1801 when the life saving stations were established, there have been a continuous there's been a continuous human presence on Sable Island, and it's a continuous government presence on Sable Island. Mm-hmm. Uh, before Confederation, it was the government of Nova Scotia. After Confederation, it would have been the government of Canada. So there have always there have been people here the year now continuously since 1801. Wow. Okay. And now, up until uh, 2013, when the park was established, the uh, Meteorological Service of Canada was the uh, primary uh, representative of the government of Canada on Sable. Uh, and then, when it became a national park, House Canada took that role. Okay. And so how are accommodations laid out for you when you when you stay there? Well, um, go back a bit to the meteorological service. Uh, in 1944, this the Sable Island Station, where we are, um, was built by the Met Service to support its aerological program, which that goes the launching of balloons into the upper atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And um, the station was laid out. Uh, I, almost like a small town. Um, it would have had a power generation building, a storage building, a food storage building, uh, two accommodation buildings, and, and the office. And basically everything was kind of spread out a bit because hmm. there wasn't any firefighting uh, capability on the island, no fire departments. So, so one, of the, one of the reasons for spacing buildings out and having, having things in separate buildings was because, you know, in the event of a fire, you'd only lose one building. That's right. Presumably. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, people would be safe. So, then now, the, the station as it is, right now, everything at the station is still the station that was built by the Meteorological Service mm-hmm. and uh, now owned by Parks Canada. So the accommodations on the island are in three separate buildings. There's the... Uh, building that's now used as an office by Parks Canada, and they also have accommodations in there. Um, There's a a building called the Visitor's Quarters. It used to be a staff house for the Met Service. So there are a number of bedrooms and beds in there, and and groups can stay there. And then there's a building called the Triplex, which was um, uh, sort of one building with three uh, uh, units in it. Each unit is is self-contained. And um, that was built by MSC uh, for the years when they had uh, originally families um, on the island with the, uh, the people working for that service. So the, all the accommodations, it's not like being in a camp. They all have, you know, there's, there's electricity, there's, um, there's dishwashers, there's uh, laundry uh, facilities. Right. Um, Basically, everything that you need to have in a small apartment in Halifax. Oh, that sounds comfortable. It is comfortable, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, so let's move along. And now that I kind of have a feel of, of how it's laid out and, you know, giving the listeners the opportunity to kind of see it as if they're there, um, uh, how... how were the horses introduced to the island? Because I've heard conflicting stories. Well, yeah, they, well, the, the, the one thing that is known is that they were deliberately introduced to Sable. They, they didn't arrive here by shipwrecks. Right. Which some people still believe. So the question is, um, there were multiple introductions of horses over the years. Um, the main question is, which, which group of horses are the ancestors of the present horses on Sable Island? Hmm. So, and there is a theory uh, um, presented by historian Barbara Christie that they may have been, it's a theory, not, not sort of an established fact, but they may have been Acadian horses that were taken from um, Indian peoples uh, during the 1755 when the Acadians were um, ex- uh, um, expelled from the grand expulsion when they, were, they had to leave Nova Scotia. <clears throat> and one of the people who was putting livestock on the island is uh, thought to have purchased some Acadian horses and therefore thought that possibly we put Acadian horses on the table. 
But another historian who is is young, Barber was a horse uh, a horse historian. Another historian which is involved, Lyle Campbell, who's, who does has been uh, an historian, basically the world's expert on the history of Sable Island. Um, he is convinced that there are already horses on the island, and even if Acadian horses were put on Sable, there are already horses here when they arrive. Hmm. So um, there is there are conflicting theories. Yes. And as yet, nothing that has really sort of is, is, is sort of the last word on that. Right. But we do know that they were put on the island in the latter half of the 1700s. Um, so the question is. Which which group of livestock were the ancestors of the present horses? And genetic work hasn't really clarified that. Interesting. And can you describe the breed? Okay, so they're not really in, in, in a sort of a breed. Breed, breed refers actually right. to. I mean, it, it refers to a group of animals within a species that is being developed by artificial selection by people. Okay, yeah. And is maintained by controlled breeding. Right. Well, that doesn't, that's not what the sable horses are. They're a, a wild population. So, um, probably more accurate than trying to describe them as a breed. They're a population with certain characteristics. Um, and what, so, what, what they can do about some of the characteristics are they're, they're small. Uh, they have, um, they're roughly about 132 to 142 centimeters, or 13 to 14 hands. Males average about 360 uh, kilograms, and females about 300. But okay. there's a wide, there's quite a lot of, of um, diversity in, in what the horses look like. Some of them have pony heads, mm-hmm. some of them have horse heads. Some of them are, are sort of small and petite. Some have a square sort of conformation, you know, drawing a line from the withers to the croup to the, to, to, to the feet. But others have kind of an elongated body plan, you know, like a, a, a longer wheelbase. So um, it's difficult to read. You know, some people will say, well, they, they have long, luxurious names. Well, no, they don't all. Um, many of them have short names. So, and color, uh, the color of the horses are, are um, chestnut, bay, black and brown. There are no um, eyeballs or skew balls. There are no spotted horses. And there are no horses that would be described as Calamino, although people have. But, but right. definitely the chestnut, some of them have fair manes, but none of them really fall under the Palomino category. Mm-hmm. And um, how, like, what are some of the factors that help the horses survive? Because they're, you're totally hands-off. Yeah, well, they, I mean, the, the population is surviving mm-hmm. uh, on the island because it's a fairly benign habitat. I and mean, people think it's a really bleak and horrible place. Uh, some people do. But in the summer, it's quite lush. I mean, we've got six species of orchids growing here, 108 wow. different uh, uh, species of plants, six of which have orchids. There are, there are a couple of species of fern. Mm-hmm. There are, um, and so, and the, the temperature on Sable Island is mild. In the summer, it doesn't get as hot as the mainland, and in the winter, it doesn't get as cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's because it's warmed, its, it's temperature is, is modified, by the surrounding ocean, which is like kind of a radiator, which is releasing heat and sucking up heat in, during during the seasons. So it's um, a more comfortable habitat to be in if you're going to be living in the outdoors. There are no predators, and um, during the peak vegetation periods, there there are some very nutritious plants here for horses, including beech pea, which is uh, has got um, high protein content. So, though, they go through. So they put on weight during the spring, summer, and fall, especially in the spring, in the summer and fall. And then they go through winter. Right. Which are far more demanding from a point of view of forage. Not so much weather-wise, but forage-wise. Because then they're, you know, they're, they're mostly, most of the beef grasses die back. And uh, some of the other plants are no longer available. 
so they're able to get some nutrition from the uh, what remains of, of the, the beef grass plants, but they then are kind of on a negative energy budget. So they go, like any wild animal, they're going through uh, uh, positive energy and, and negative energy. They're gaining and leaving, gaining and leaving, depending upon the season. Right. Um, so there's that. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. No, no, no. Please, please keep going. It's, uh, it's fascinating. It's so interesting that, you know. Okay. Yeah, please. So the, and they, they do, uh, well, you, you were going to ask about parasites at some point. I was, yeah. They are, they, <laughs> as I said, they have, no, they have no predators. They're not disturbed. They leave a fairly peaceable existence. Um, they're not they're not stressed out by, you know, being chased about or, or whatever. Right. Um, and so... And they do get shelter, even though they have no, there are, you know, there's nothing provided for them. They can't get shelter from the rain or the snow that's falling down on top of them. Mm-hmm. But they can get very good shelter from the, the uh, dunes um, during anything coming sort of at an angle, like a wind. Or yeah, wind I was going to ask you about that. Wind and snow. Mm-hmm. Because there is a lot of, um, a lot of irregular profile on sable. Well, some of the dunes are they are very large dunes in some places. Mm. Like the, uh, the highest dune on Sable is about 28 meters. Mm. It's one of the, the, the largest dunescapes in, in eastern Canada. And so there's a lot of places where, no matter what the wind direction is, where the horses can stand in the lee of a dune, in the lee of, a, of, uh, of an eroding space, or the, in the lee of a hill. And so they can get shelter out of the uh, um, more severe impacts of, of some of the some of the weather and conditions that we have here. Right, and so what about fresh water access? Well, okay, so fresh water on Sable Island um, is available to the horses at freshwater ponds, uh, which are slowly declining in number. Um, they get water from ephemeral uh, flood pools in the areas of dunes, which can form any time of the year and more often persist during the throughout the winter and spring, um, where you just have the, the water table is higher, so the water sort of comes up above the surface of the sand, and so you have the pools of fresh water, mm-hmm. and they dig for water, and they can dig for water pretty much you know from one end of the island to the other. And what they do is they go into low areas, blowouts between the dunes, where the sand surface is very close to the top of the water table, and they just get down into it. And the amount of digging they have to do will, will vary depending upon the time of year. So, for instance, in, um, in the winter, because you have more ephemeral pools um, just to run the surface of the sand, in areas well, where they do dig, they might dig only a couple of centimeters to get to water. Then in the summer, they maybe July, uh, when there's, um, it's warmer, there's been more evaporation, the, the water table is a bit lower, then they might have to dig anywhere from 30 to 40 centimeters to get to water. Is ice... So that's oh, the, sorry. That's, okay, so I just have to explain the water table. Yeah, please. Because uh, it's called a freshwater lens. Hmm. And it's uh, a body of fresh water that is resting on top of the salt water table because fresh water is not as dense as salt water. So, it's a big sand island. It's sand all the way through. So, as you can imagine, the salt water table, you know, would be sort of represented like right through the island. Mm-hmm. When you have any kind of precipitation, so rain or snow melt, that will run down through the sand and come, and, and come in contact with the salt water table. So, then what you have is uh, this bulge of fresh water that's always being replenished by precipitation and is at, at the top and mm-hmm. at the bottom is slowly diffusing into the salt water table. Okay. So, then, wherever there are low areas between the dunes, like the low areas of elevation, the fresh water lens, the top of it, is exposed. And that's what gives you your ponds. And that's what the horses are digging into when they dig water holes. Okay. 
Wow. And and you I guess there's no you don't have to worry about ice and them not being able to get through to the to the water because of oh, ice. Yeah, we do get well if it, because it's it's warmer in the winter here than I mean it still gets below freezing but not as uh, not as below freezing as on the mainland. Right. And the temperature kind of bounces around in the winter from, you know, plus plus 5 to maybe minus 10. So there, ice does occasionally form on the ponds. Mm-hmm. It tends not to be thick. It's pretty thin. And it doesn't last for long because the temperature is always bouncing around. But the thing is that where the horse is um, at the edge of the ponds, where the ice is weakened by the fact that there's all this vegetation growing up through it. And so for the most part, it's easily broken. Okay. You know, by stepping on it with your hoof. That's good that um, it's mild enough to do that. times... There, there have been a few times when we've had a cold snap and the ponds froze uh, fairly thickly for a, a few days to a week. And at that point, the, I saw horses eating snow. Okay. And uh, that they could also uh, kind of uh, break the ice in some of these ephemeral pools, which were shallower. Okay. So there haven't been any indications. Nothing, nothing reported or observed that indicated that the horses were having that problem uh, with access to water. Oh, yeah, I was just thinking in terms of climate change, if ice is going to become more and more prevalent, um, something for it, well, everything. Well, see, everything is going to be affected by climate. Exactly. Change. Yeah. The species, the species of vegetation that they eat, the amount of the, the impact of of ocean storms on the island. Right. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the water table, everything. So, I mean, the amount of precipitation, uh, including and temperatures, as you mentioned. So that's, a, that's an unknown. Um, mm-hmm. Stable will be affected. Uh, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a fragile environment in, in some ways. So it'll certainly be affected by climate change, although at this stage it's kind of unclear. Right. However, since you mention it, yeah. at the moment there are four, <coughs> uh, a small research team at the station here, <coughs> excuse me, mm-hmm. um, they're here for about five days, I think, and they're doing, they're, uh, they are hydrologists, and they're studying the ponds and groundwater. They've installed monitoring systems wow. to measure changes in the, uh, the flow and, uh, and position of groundwater in the ponds. And that is, in fact, to look at the possible effects of climate change. Well, I'm glad I asked you. (laughs) Yes. That was good timing. (laughs) Totally by fluke. (laughs) Um, They're associated with Dalhousie University. Oh, oh, wow. That's great. Um, Let's talk about the fragility of the island just for a second because you brought it up. Um, Is, you know... How how do the people that that go there and do the research feel about visitors, and, and what types of protections um, are there for protecting the island in general from human activities? Yes, yeah, I'm talking about people that want to maybe visit, and how what's that feel like? Okay. It must be frustrating. <laughs> Well, the thing is that Sable Island is a dune system, and dune systems everywhere on the planet are fragile, mm-hmm. and most of them are, are have been severely impacted by human activities. Dune systems are basically like like the ship absorber for the for the land because they are meant to kind of absorb the energy of storms. They they erode, they grow again, and and it's a very dynamic, ever changing kind of habitat. Um, Sable Island, having been a uh, government uh, base for a few hundred years, there was always restricted access. It's never been open. Um, since 1801, access has been restricted. In the early days, it was for different reasons. It was you know, to do with shipwrecks and things like that. But once, um, uh, with, you know, over the, since, like, the past 50 to 60 years with Environment Canada kind of taking the lead on the island, uh, continues to be restricted access. There have always been guidelines about um, about human activities, although they became um, more comprehensive as time went on. In the old days, for instance, uh, roads, you know, were vehicles were used, drivers were doomed, and roads were created. The Met Service in the 1990s started uh, closing roads on the island and doing restoration work. 
so that uh, by the time Parks Canada took over, there was only really uh, one road, and that would be the road from the station out to the south on those sides of the island. So there are all the rules that applied even before it became a park was no driving on the vegetation mm -hmm. uh, with vehicles. Um, research we were restricted to the beach or to the designated sort of driveway roads. Uh, no digging up the vegetation. No, um, basically everything that you would have in place to prevent damage to the to the dune vegetation, which protects and protects the dune system. Mm -hmm. The vegetation builds the dunes, and the vegetation sustains the dunes. Okay. So yes, and so basically, because the activity was restricted even before Parks Canada, people were there, there was tourism here. Um, people oh. were allowed to visit, but they still had to get permission from Coast Guard to come, and Coast Guard uh, wouldn't let any large numbers of people visit unless you know there were special arrangements made. So then, um, those and, and visitors were given a you know environmental briefing. If there was, they were usually had a guide, um, a volunteer person to walk about with them and, and show them things. So now that it's a park, many of the same. Um, and visitor guidelines or rules are in place, and so there has been, I would, you know, for, for, for like since probably since the fifties, an emphasis on trying to protect the uh, on protecting the dune system and the vegetation and the endemic species that are on the island, and that that has continued to be part kind of. Wow. That's, so, yeah. I think you're asking about visitors. So, yeah. there are, Parks Canada, of course, is more about visitation than uh, than the Met Service was. You know, they they uh, uh, welcome visitors, but that really wasn't their role. Um, Parks Canada's role is to uh, um, um, kind of manage the island so that people can visit it. But they're still keeping, but the numbers are low, because there are other parks in the country where um, where people aren't allowed to visit unless they get permission. Um, and so that's the situation here. So if anybody wants to visit now, they have to get permission from Parks Canada. And Parks uh, has, you know, has a number of slots that they'll allow usually like uh, between May, I think it is, May and October. Mm -hmm. um, visitors can come. There's a slot for visitors on almost every weekend. And okay. a few groups they've got the expedition vessels like Adventure Canada um, they can come out and they would bring they might have 100 to 150 people who want to come ashore and then a lot more rules kick in for that with um, the groups broken smaller groups and everybody has to be on a guided walk nobody can uh, do anything on their own and there's uh, an area for those walks so it's just basically a one site where people can uh, uh, come ashore and um, have, a, have a, you know, spend three or four hours on the island. So the island is protected uh, from basically. There's yeah, the, the island is well protected and it has been for, for for quite a long time from the impacts of human activity. Right. It's so um, it's so undisturbed by human activity it's nice to see it's it's nice to keep it that way You're kind of fading out oh sorry can you hear can you hear can you hear me uh barely oh weird okay just a second hello better i uh, no it's not better but i'll just Sorry about that. We're we're getting a lot of rain today, so we're getting a lot of rain. So maybe that's that's part of it. Maybe. Yeah, it would affect it. Yeah. <laughs> and you're so far away right now, and I'm sure the connection isn't great <laughs> from the island. Um, the other thing I just wanted to touch on is uh, leading causes of mortality among the herd, or yeah, among the herd. Horses. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, um <laughs> um, no predators, so that's not a cause of mortality. But um, uh, winter, winter weather, spring weather, for instance, see, if we get weather that's um, cold, but not cold enough for precipitation to be coming as snow, but rather to be falling as rain, then you get the horses get wet. 
they have thick coats in the winter, which can really, really are, are, are effective. And, you know, they can get a load of snow landing on their backs and they don't get chilled. But as soon as their coats get soaked by rain in cold weather, which is typical of early spring, late winter and early spring, um, then that's, that's uh, uh, very hard on them. Mm-hmm. And so that lowers their, their resistance to various things. They can become, they can uh, suffer injuries. Uh, that's less, much less of a, a common so, a cause of mortality. You know, occasionally you know, see a, a horse bitten by a gray seal or um, getting tangled up in something, or uh, uh, particularly males, but sometimes females being injured during uh, interactions between horses, you know, fights between stallions and stallions chasing mares around and that sort of thing. And so, and, um, yeah. Yeah. so the thing is, and, and certainly like starvation is a cause of mortality, but it's complicated because all of the things I just mentioned can lead to starvation, or starvation can cause some susceptibilities to some of the things that I mentioned. So um, uh, it's generally, I guess you could generally say uh, uh, severe weather conditions are particularly, not severe as in hurricanes, but weather conditions that where you have uh, wet weather combined with cold weather. So, um, so at that sort of cusp where well, winter starts to turn to spring. Yeah, that's um, a that's, that's a tough that's period. A yeah. That's a yeah. tough period of time. Um, and let's just circle back to the hurricanes you just mentioned. How, how do they handle that? Oh, it's not that much of a problem. They just stand in their shelter areas. Right. Uh, you know, they stay out of the wind so they don't get sandblasted. They do exactly the same as we do. We stay in our shelter areas, too. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good to know. That makes me feel better about, <laughs> about them when I know that the hurricanes <laughs> are coming up. Um, the other thing the I want... about wa- hurricanes is that yeah. because they're tropical storms, they're yeah. usually warm. Yes, exactly. They, you know, it's, it, they happen in warmer weather, so even if there's a lot of rain associated with them, yeah, um, it's not as hard on the horses. Yeah, so that's that's good to know. That's that's really that's re- that's a relief. And uh, and how many horses are on the island roughly? Would you say? Well, the population has been sort of slowly increasing over mm-hmm. the last thirty years. Um, they're up. There's there's bouncing around five hundred now. Okay. Okay. And how many herds would you say? Um, well, they're broken up into uh, family groups, uh, the band and, and bachelor bands. So at the moment, I haven't actually been out. I've been doing beach stuff, so I haven't been out to see how they've distributed this spring. Right. But uh, even when there were, say, uh, when I first started um, looking at the horses in the uh, late 80s, there could be, depending upon the number of horses on the island, it, it could be like anywhere from uh 30 to 50 individual bands. The band, I mean, a, 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 a family band is going to be from two to sometimes as many as 10 horses. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, more than 10 horses is less common, but um, it's so two being a male and a female, but then you, know, you have uh, juveniles and foals and other mares and whatnot increasing the size of the band depending upon the band's volume. I have two more questions to ask you. Well, a uh, three. Um, you mentioned about the um, you studying the gray seal population and um, shark attacks. Uh, are those predominantly from the great whites? Uh, no. Um, the, there are certainly, <coughs> when, when we look into, I, I worked on this with a shark expert from uh, um, uh, the, um, the uh, is it Ozert? No, Ozert, sure. Studying apex predators. Yeah. But um, in the state, she's based in Narragansett in Rhode Island, although she's retired now. But huh. we, um, about 10%, less than 10% of the injuries on seals looks like they have been inflicted by white sharks. Um, most of the injuries were um, caused by as unyet identified predator, but all the circumstantial evidence suggested that was likely the Greenland shark, which has a somewhat different um, predatory strategy from the, the sharks like the white shark, which has big teeth. That's so interesting. So the Greenland shark is yeah. 
right now um, is, is still a theoretical, uh, a theoretically responsible for um, predation on um, seal around seals. Okay. Some predation, white shark is also. I just have a curiosity about those uh, about sharks too, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Um, is <laughs> This one's a bit. This one, and uh, and that's kind of concluding my um, my conversations about horses with you. Um, but I was wondering, I I was reading a book and um, the pale lady came up, and I, and I mean I'll tell the listeners the story about that. But is that something that you've seen, or have you heard stories about it? So you're talking about Mrs. Copeland and her ring? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to tell the story yeah. in detail because <laughs> people will be like, what is she uh, talking about? <laughs> so it's it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's a ghost story that's probably based on uh, act, like actual fact history. Mrs. Copeland uh, did, did, uh, was lost um, the, the, during the loss of the ship Francis. Okay, everyone, let's pause. The Pale Lady, also known as Mrs. Copeland, was the wife of a surgeon traveling on the ship Francis. This is Sable Island's most famous ghost story, and I'm going to tell you about it. The Francis sunk in the waters off Sable in 1799. A captain by the name of Torrens was put in charge of salvaging and burials. Captain Torrens and his dog Whiskey took a break and stayed in a small hut on the east tip of Sable. It is there, in her white dress and soaked with water, that Mrs. Copeland appeared and claimed to have been murdered for her wedding ring. Captain Torrens was so shaken by this vision that he vowed to find the ring. And eventually he did. He found it and returned it to the family. However, Mrs. Copeland is still seen along the beach occasionally, and she is sewn into the folklore of the island. Um, and then a little bit of some of the ghost stories is kind of um, a fictionalized version of, of Mrs. Copeland's story on Sable. Some people, I don't know of anybody, like in, since I've been here, uh, who ever has said that they've seen Mrs. Copeland, although many people have tried to um, play practical jokes on other people concerning <laughs> the ghost. <laughs> But there has, I mean, there there are so yeah the, the um, sightings of ghosts because there there are other stories which are a bit more ghosty, like uh, a less less connected with a, a fictional story, right? Um, a fictionalized part of the story, like for instance, during the uh, life saving station days, when they used uh, the surf boats to you know the, the, the boat handlers and the surfmen went out through the surf to try to rescue people off ships. And there was one incident where uh, one of the oarsmen was washed over the side and drowned. And for uh, years, um, the, some of the oarsmen claimed to see that during a particularly difficult time, an extra oarsman joined the boat and helped them get through the waves. And then wow. it disappeared after it was done. And that, oh. that's, the, that's the kind of, a, nobody's seen that. But there's, yeah. there's, there's some really interesting stories that... Um, you know, if you know, Sable Island is a place where so many people had, you know, died and drowned, you know, drowned and mm-hmm. otherwise died on Sable Island during the life saving station years, there's not as many ghost stories, not as many, as many sightings and observations as you might think for a place like this with such a history. What, what, what other things happen? You know, I bet. Strange lights and things like Yeah. That. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to pick your brain on that someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you like people to to know about the island from your experience? What would you like to tell? Is there anything you'd like to tell the listeners just before um, we conclude our interview? Well, Sable Island is, is unique uh, in the world. There isn't another island. There isn't another sand island so far out to sea 
and so rich in, in biodiversity as Sable Island. And it's a real treasure that Nova, you know, people in Nova Scotia and, and Canadians have as, as part of our, our, uh, our cultural and historical legacy and our natural legacy now. The island is, um, is it's a remarkable place to be because there are no trees. And so it's, it's so easy to see everything happening. So, you know, when birds turn up, they're easy to see because they're not hiding in the bushes. Um, there's, you know, cycles of life and death are very obvious here. Um, you know, something dying and, and decomposing, and then, you know, you see the, the adult sparrows eating, picking grubs and things from the corpses that they're going to use to feed their young, and it just cycles around and around. And I think the thing about stable is, it can really, it's, it's, it provides opportunities for introducing us to all kinds of different concepts and things that we should understand. And it's a really important place to monitor, uh, for instance, the health of the, of the oceans because it's a platform way out at sea, which is, is controlled. So we you know, we know what's happening on the islands. But when you see plastic debris washing up on the beach, you know that everything that has come ashore has been delivered by the ocean. It's not contamination from the island itself. And for atmospheric research, because it's way out here, again, it's really important for atmospheric research, for understanding our environment. So Sable Island is important in two ways. It's, it's important in itself because it's such a remarkable place. But it's also important in how it can help us learn about other uh, other environmental effects and and uh, processes. Well, Zoe Lucas, thank you so much for your work as a naturalist and for your work on the island and for sharing the knowledge that you've that you've um, accumulated over your long history uh, with Sable Island. Um, I appreciate your time, and I'm, I know my listeners are going to really love hearing uh, from you and your perspective on Sable. So thank you for joining Horse Tales, and um, I appreciate it. Thanks for your interest. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to today's show. I'm your host, Ashley. I've written and produced this episode. You can find my podcast wherever you get your digital media on the go, including Podbean, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. There's a few others, but those are the main ones. If you like the show, hit like and subscribe, or leave me a comment. Thanks, everyone. Until I see you again, happy trail riding.